Okay, Luke, we're back. Mm -hmm. And uh, this week, let's talk about something a little bit out there. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this concept. Um, look, it's a concept that we've, we see in the media now and again. We've seen it on Futurama. All right, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so let, let's, this week, let's try and understand this concept of what is a Boltzmann brain and am I one? Right, well, there's some tricky questions there. I think the first place where Boltzmann brains turn up and where you've got to kind of take them seriously is within your theories. So we're, we're trying to do cosmology here. And when you're a cosmologist, you're trying to have a model for the whole universe, or at least a great big bit of the universe, okay? So it, it matters when you're doing uh, cosmology that um, whenever you do a model of the universe, that we're, we're inside of the model. We're inside of the system that we're supposedly... Um, that, that we're trying to, to make a model of and trying to understand. So a way I think of, of, of trying to, to understand this is it's the difference between, imagine that you know, Dr. Frankenstein sets up his equipment and he's trying to make a new life form and he presses, you know, you know, pulls the big lever or whatever. And, but he's outside of it. He can just look at it, he can observe it whenever he likes, he pulls the switches. Versus, imagine being the monster and you wake up uh, you, this is your first moment of consciousness and you look around and you see these, this equipment and now you're trying to understand it. But there's, there's a very different thing that's happening there. You're trying to understand the thing that made you in the first place. And so as, as cosmologists, um, we're trying to understand the thing that made us in the first place. So it's, it's, it's pretty weird. I mean, the, the processes by which this body turned up in the universe. And the reason why that's important is because in any in any theory any physical theory especially in physics but all of science really the question is um can it explain what we observe and if we're trying to do that for a universe for you know the whole great big bit of the universe we have to worry about the question or all right not just how is the system behaving that's frankenstein's question but how does it make the thing that is then observing the system right so that's that's the added uh, problem that that the Frankenstein's monster has. He he is is looking at something which not uh, which he's trying to understand. How does this thing that made me? How does it behave? So there's, he's sort of entwined with that. Okay, but what has this got to do with Boltzmann, who is a you know a physicist from late 1800s, early 1900s, okay. and brains? Well, here's what here's so Boltzmann had an idea of how the universe worked where this distinction between I'm inside the system somewhere actually really properly came into full view for, for physicists and cosmologists. So he was worried about the question of, of the heat death of the universe. So he was one of the pioneers. This is Ludwig Boltzmann, Austrian physicist, late 18th century. Uh, he was worried about the fact... 19th century. 19th century. <laughs> they, mm. D David Mitchell would be so upset. David Mitchell, sorry, David Mitchell. Uh, um, um, I'm going to leave that in because, yeah, it shows we're not historians. Okay, so late 19th century, um, he is worried about the fact that they've discovered this second law of thermodynamics, according to which um, the amount of useful energy in the universe, the amount of low entropy energy in the universe, the amount of free energy that can be transformed into some other form, that amount is going down always, every time we do anything, right? When you, when you tally up the total amount of useful energy in the universe, you always have less than you had before. And so the question is, all right, well, why is there any? I mean, if the universe was infinitely old, then however much there was at any particular time, you know, it just down to zero, uh, there shouldn't be any around now. Um, and one of the things that Boltzmann understood was that the second law is a statistical law. It's about what almost always happens. It almost always is the case that the amount of useful energy goes down. But here's, here's his idea. Maybe the universe as a whole is in fact in a state where there's no, on average, there's no useful energy around. And we call that state thermal equilibrium. So the air in this room is roughly in thermal equilibrium. There's no heat difference between here and over there. I couldn't use that to do anything useful. Okay, maybe the whole universe is like that. But because there's always these atoms bouncing around at random, if there's some arrangement of stuff that would be useful, eventually, and we're talking you know, ridiculously long periods of time, but eventually that arrangement will turn up somewhere just by chance. Just the, the stuff of the universe will come together and that thing will be there. 
So there's a certain probability that the air in this room will arrange itself into some, you know, maybe all of it will come over to this side of the room for 10 seconds. But a v very low probability. E extra, like ridiculously, you can't believe how small these 10 to the, t you, ne you start needing to stack up powers, 10, you know, how many years, 10 to the 10 to the something. But, but in an infinite universe, an infinitely old, an infinitely large universe, yep. these exceedingly rare events would happen. Yes. So you're saying that Boltzmann's idea is that maybe the entire universe is actually at its heat death in thermal yep. equilibrium. Yep. But this patch of the universe, i.e. everything we see around us, is, is, has fluctuated out of, out, out of that smooth background yep. such that we've got a patch of order in an infinite sea of disorder. Yes. Okay. That's his idea, and he puts it forward in a, in a really interesting, really nice paper in 1895. Okay. Uh, and Which is in the 19th century. It is in the 19th <laughs> century, as, as viewers will note. It's about 30 years later when um, uh, Arthur Eddington is thinking through this and, and sort of spots a problem here. So let's think about, we want to explain our observations of the universe. And so the most general way we can think about this is, okay, my brain at the moment is in a certain state. There's 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 all the atoms there. They're in a some sort of arrangement. Let's just let's just take that arrangement of atoms in my brain and just call that, you know, my brain at the moment. Okay. Where is that brain going to turn up in Boltzmann's universe? Okay. Right. Under what circumstances will that brain turn up? Because then that'll have all the observations recorded somewhere in there. Okay. Um and, and we can think of two ways of doing that. There's the way we think it happened in our universe, which is there's lots of order at the beginning. That order is used used to make uh, galaxies and stars and planets, and there's chemicals on those planets, and they um, they form life somehow, replicating life, and then evolution takes over, and intelligence you know evolves, and over that sort of billion year time scale, from a very low entropy, very useful energy beginning, out out at the end of that comes my brain as part of this universe. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Okay. Here's a second way. Just wait for one of these fluctuations to make my brain and nothing else. And just chaos around. The usual boring equilibrium chaos. And in the middle of it, my brain. Okay. And what Eddington realized was, if you're just waiting for these unlikely fluctuations, okay, that's the game you're playing. You know, all, they're extremely unlikely. But... The brain, the isolated brain, is incredibly more likely than the other story about, you know, cosmic and then biological evolution. So let, let me get this picture right. So we're in a, a universe which is in thermal equilibrium. We've reached the heat death. Yep. There will be fluctuations of things popping in and yep. out of existence. And uh, the if I wait long enough, I, I could see an entire universe of ours appear. Yep. Or a brain, but it's much more likely that the brain will appear because it's yes. a smaller fluctuation. So for every time there's a universe, I could imagine there could be lots and lots of brains yeah. popping in and out of existence. Yes. Right? So here's why this matters. So it's not that... So th there is, within the philosophical literature, right? there's this old problem of how do I know I'm not just a brain in a vat? Okay? It seems like I could just be a brain and then I, you know, I think there's a bookshelf over there, but actually that's just light being fed in. You know... The modern version is, how do I know I'm not in the matrix? That's an interesting problem when we can talk about that, but that's not this problem at the moment. It's, it's, it seems related. The problem is we're trying to think through a theory and the predictions of a theory. We're trying to think through Boltzmann's particular theory. And the reason why we think that that theory fails is because um, for every time when I, we get a brain in which that brain is actually the result of all the processes that that brain thinks made that brain, we get all those other brains who are kidding themselves, who think that they're in a body, which is in a, doing a podcast, but actually it's it just out of the, the universe and in five seconds it's going back into the, the, um, you know, the, the, the chaos around it. The problem with that theory then is, and here's the important step is, what we do is we go, okay, Never mind the philosophical problem. The problem with that theory is that it sort of sh it cuts off the, l the limb that it's sitting on. So I look in the universe, I study the universe around me, I understand the way that um, 
physics works. I build on the work of Boltzmann and all those other guys. I think I understand the second law of thermodynamics and how atoms work. And on the basis of that, I calculate the probability of these two answers. And if, if I was the brain in this scenario, just the isolated brain, it would, it would, the consequence of that would be actually all that stuff where I learned physics, that never happened. And all of the things, the observations of the universe, they never happened either because th th that universe isn't out there. Like we, we never learned anything about thermodynamics from going and building factories because that never happened. There's a brain here that thinks they remember that or read it in a textbook, but it never really happened. And so that, that theory, that outcome shoots itself you know, in the foot. It cuts off the limb that it's standing on. If, if that theory is correct, then n none of physics ever happened. And so the Boltzmann brain problem is this. If you end up, when you put together a, th a complete picture of the universe, if most of the observers are wrong about what they conclude about the universe, then you've got a problem there because you've got a theory that if it's true, no one could ever know that it's true. And in fact, all, almost all of the observers in the universe would come to the wrong conclusion about the universe that they're in. And that's a very weird, you know, if, if that turns out to be true of your model, then it's kind of shot itself in the foot. Kind of. I must admit, I, I do have a bit of a soft spot for Boltzmann's brains. Okay. Right, because if, um, if our universe is going to evolve as we think it's going to evolve, mm -hmm. we think it's infinitely large, it's got an infinite future ahead of it. Yeah. There will be lots and lots of this... Uh, space and thermodynamic equilibrium that we would expect Boltzmann's brains to appear in the distant future, even yep. in the universe as we understand it. Yeah, yeah. And given the infinite amount of time, the number of observers in the future universe who could be Boltzmann brains vastly outnumbers the, yeah. the number of biological observers that we have on this planet or any, or any of the other planets that are potentially out there. Yeah. So we can, we can say maybe, maybe Boltzmann's ideas about our universe sitting in this thermodynamic sort of soup uh, doesn't sort of work. Yeah. But we do have the future of our universe to worry about. Yeah, so this is... So Boltzmann's case is, a, is a, I think, a nice, clear, clean example of where you might have thought the universe was like that. It might seem to explain some stuff around it, but actually when you think, you think more deeply about it and about where the observers are going to turn up, actually, nope, that one's gone. Okay, it's got a Boltzmann brain problem and throw, we throw it in the bin. And now we have to worry about, okay, let's look at all the current textbooks and all the current papers and look at all the theories we have at the moment. Are any of them actually falling into this trap without us knowing it? And as you say, it seems like our universe is because this, this, you know, low, this, this completely chaotic state where things come in fluctuating, that was what created the problem for Boltzmann. That's what's predicted for the future of our universe, as you say. Uh, and this has led to all sorts of weird ideas about how we might get around this problem. Maybe our universe actually recollapses into the future uh, against all the evidence that we have at the moment. There's some bit of physics that we must be missing. Otherwise, we're going to have Boltzmann's brains. Yeah, and, and again, the problem is, you know, take the whole history of our universe, not just up to where we are, look in the infant far in the future take my brain as the template or your brain or just some brain or whatever and find all of them in the whole set and there's the one that's in this room now you uh, think hopefully <laughs> uh yeah there's there's the one there's the one that's correct there's the one that's actually sitting in this room actually was produced which i assume is me um <laughs> but there's also if you wait long enough there's trillions and, and as many as you like out off into the distant future who have the same brain state and are wrong. And so this is that problem again. You've got a cosmological model in which most of the observers come to the wrong conclusion about what the universe is really like. Uh, and that would sort of shoot itself in the foot because um, it, you know, you could go look at my brain into the future, but you could also find all the all the brains in the future that think they are in uh, a steady state universe or you find all the brains in the future that have done have, that think they did physics right and think that they're in newton's universe or something like you know so in that at that point you've got a real real problem well i'm glad we cleared that up yeah. yes <laughs> to to our viewers who may or may not be out there i yeah. i think we'll have to come back to this topic at some point in the future yeah so the the conclusion here is not yeah again 
go go talk about brains and vats and the matrix if you like but that's not this particular problem this particular problem is you know um i'm if you've got a theory of the universe it which the most likely way for it to make observers is just via a random fluctuation whether it's this far thus far in the universe or into the future then you've got to take this problem seriously because you know you've got to take your theory seriously you've got to take the whole lot of it you can't just take the bit you don't like and throw it away yeah and th this is the boltzmann brain thing is not is not um is not physicist making up some weird scenario it's physicists taking scenarios they think have a good chance of actually being a description of this universe and taking it all seriously and then finding oh no there's some weirdness in here that we weren't <laughs> we weren't thinking of and we didn't recognize in the first place